Imagine someone telling you you might never see your grandmother again. Not because she passed away, but because of a travel ban. As a Muslim and as a Syrian American, when Donald Trump became president, I was horrified. I couldn't believe that the man who attacked my faith on television was now the leader of my country and for a long time, I was raging with anger. When I signed up for a history class called Trump's America, I expected to be surrounded by people who were mourning, people who were as enraged as I was. But in this classroom, I was shocked to find myself come face to face with people who voted for and supported Trump. Honestly, I was terrified. And for a long time, I didn't tell people in the class I was Muslim. Even though I was holding back, I panicked every time I walked into that room. When I finally did tell the class I was Muslim, my heart was pounding and my voice was shaking and I cried. The response from the class was silence. Being in that room was one of the most painful things I've ever had to do. Some people said that they were ashamed for voting for Trump and other people felt really proud that they did. Sometimes people cried because they just felt so hopeless. Other times, people walked out. Students of color physically left the room when they heard racist comments, only to return for the next class. Sometimes I could not believe the words that were coming out of people's mouths. Sometimes I wanted to scream, and I got mad at the professor for not calling people out. But despite all the pain, when class time rolled around every Tuesday and Thursday, we all always came back. We sat down and we spoke and we listened. We got it all out and we confronted the difficult things that we didn't want to hear. Every day was intense and every day was emotional. But over the semester, I got to know these people very personally. Two people in particular changed me. And I have changed their names to protect their identities. First, there was George. So shy at first, and he couldn't get his words out. But over the semester, he started talking more and teaching me a lot. I remember him telling the class that caring for the environment was nice, but his family, who worked at the factory plant in southern Indiana, couldn't afford to do that when they were living paycheck to paycheck. Another time in class, we were having a really intense debate, and someone cut me off as I was speaking. But in that moment, George stood up for me. He told the student who interrupted to let her talk and finish. This may seem like such a small gesture, but to me, it reflected on so much of his character. A Trump supporter was standing up for me. Yeah, he was. Then there was Leo. Leo was an interesting one. During class discussions, his views were incredibly liberal. He defended minorities, he condemned racist policies, and he was passionate about educating others. But then one day in class, Leo shocked us all by confessing that he voted for Trump. Leo's revelation felt like a betrayal, and for a long time, all I could think was how could someone with such open-minded beliefs vote for a candidate who attacked minorities? Turns out that Leo came from a single-parent household, and Trump's tax breaks would have helped his mom's small business and helped her fund his college tuition. 
The irony of my situation was that I went into the class seeing Trump supporters as closed-minded. But the truth is, I was the closed-minded one. These people who voted for Trump had good hearts. They were kind. And I was passing them all off as people without empathy or compassion. But the truth is, they were just people with lives and concerns that led to a different set of criteria at the ballot box. They weren't all racist, xenophobic, or selfish. They just considered different issues when casting their vote. I don't know when it happened, but it got to a point where I stopped raging with anger. The pain made me stronger, and I found something that I never thought I would. Peace. Whether we want to admit it or not, we all come in with stereotypes of what a Trump supporter is. And then all of a sudden, your identity becomes who you voted for. But how do we undo that? We need to listen compassionately and form ongoing relationships with people outside of our social groups. And most importantly, we need to do some self-reflection, the deepest type of self-reflection where we realize that when we walk into a room, we are coming in with our own set of assumptions that are just as incorrect as everyone else's. Once we make that realization, we experience the power of a personal connection. Because when we meet someone, whether they are gay or Mexican or from rural America, and get to know their lives, we learn something. And then we stop and think for a minute. And this knowledge begins to shape our minds and the way we think about future situations we're less likely to buy into the negative comments in the media and we're more open to love and empathy and acceptance. Only through the power of a personal connection can we give people the exposure to shape their mindsets. We must realize that changing laws, even at the highest levels, does not mean that we magically change people's minds. So as we approach a new decade, where do these connections form? Let's start in our communities. Let's address this pain that divides us. And let's be brave enough to engage in some self-reflection. We're going to make mistakes, and we're going to have to experiment. It's going to take courage, and it's going to take time, and we're going to have to get all of our biases and stereotypes and fears that have built up over generations out into the open. I don't know what comes next, but what I do know is where we are right now isn't leading us anywhere. Change is never comfortable. I understand. I've been there but we have to at least try.